75 years in the story of the family as a social institution is very short indeed. And yet, in that time, the pattern of family life in America has undergone radical changes. On a farm in the 1880s, family life followed a pattern which had been characteristic of America from early colonial times. Three generations of a family lived and worked together. The father was head of the family in the fullest sense of the word. He had the primary economic responsibility for its survival, and he was the final source of authority. He was teacher as well as parent, and from him, his sons learned their vocation. In those days, a farm family was an economic unit complete in itself, held together by a division of labor among its members. The mother, in addition to her traditional responsibility for the rearing of children, had regular duties, such as the preparing of food. When she was not preparing meals, there were many other things to be done. Churning butter, putting up preserves for the winter, and keeping the farmhouse clean. Her role in maintaining the family, both biologically and economically, was an important one. And it was clearly defined, so far as the division of labor was concerned. Even grandparents fitted into the economic picture. They often lived with the family and participated in the work of the farm until necessitated by old age or illness. Rosemary, is Emmy up there with you? What was that, Mama? I said, is Emmy up there with you? I just can't keep track of that child. Yes, she's here. All right, I just wanted to know. Stop that this minute, Emma Jane. What are you trying to do? Ruin Mom's new dress? I wasn't hurt nothing. You mean anything. Nothing. Grandpa says it that way. You'd better behave yourself, young lady, or I won't make you a new dress. Never? No, never. You will, too. You got to. Just because you make all the clothes for the whole family, you think you're so smart. Stop that and get out of here before I sew you right up on the machine. You couldn't catch me even if you had a head start. Emma is too young to have as definite a role in the division of labor as her sister Rosemary. But her older brother Franklin has already had his duties assigned. Chief among them is the care of the poultry. After harvest is over, all the children will go back to school at the little red schoolhouse four miles away. And Emma will have studies to keep her busy. Unpopular as she seems to be today, there's one person who was always glad to see her, Grandpa. Emma knows that she's the apple of his eye, and she has no hesitation in taking advantage of it. Grandpa is almost 70, but he is still of real help on the farm, particularly in the care of the livestock. In the American family of the past, religion played an important role in holding the family together as an institution. It was not exclusively an individual experience. The family participated in it as a group, in church and at home too. On Sunday afternoons, the father read aloud from the Bible. The Lord will not send the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casts away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with the slack hand. The hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a set cause of shame. Frank sleeps in the harvest, Papa. Emma, do not interrupt the reading of the scripture. Blessings are upon the head of the just. Violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The wise in heart will receive commandments but a prating fool shall fall. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely. Sunday was not given over exclusively to religion. Later in the day, 
visiting families and friends was an approved kind of Sabbath recreation. On evenings during the week, the kitchen usually served as a living room, especially during the winter, because the stove was there. Although games were prohibited on Sunday, during the week, they were a favorite kind of recreation, with all three generations taking part. The children's school year was a short one, because all the children were useful on the farm. Consequently, parents often assumed the role of teacher, too. Rosemary is entertaining a suitor in the parlor. Courtship in the 1880s had stricter rules than today. Activities connected with the church, and especially Wednesday evening prayer meeting, gave courting couples their opportunities to meet. Mama, will you play for us? Yes, daughter. Their only real chance to be alone was in the home of the girl, where her parents could chaperone the meeting. This, then, was the American farm family of the 1880s, a group which was closely knit, economically as well as emotionally. It was a secure group, too, held together by strong religious belief and mutuality of work and of recreation. But the social forces that resulted from the Industrial Revolution were already at work, and this pattern of family life was to be changed dramatically and radically. The birth of a new century was not far off, and with it, a new way of life for the American family. With the growth of factories, the family as an economic unit with a division of labor began to disappear. Factories hired individuals, not families. Industrial expansion brought with it the growth of cities, and this too changed the traditional pattern of family life. Increasingly, families lived in apartments, not houses. This urban way of life brought with it greater individualism, more opportunities for self-expression, but at the expense of the family and home ties. But the greatest force of change in the traditional pattern of American family life was the changed status of woman herself. The feminist movement, which began in 1848, was originally directed against masculine domination. For many years, suffragettes campaigned to get the vote for women. But it was not until 1920 that women in all states of the Union could vote. But the factor of greatest change was the increasing employment of women outside the home, in factories, in commercial services, and in the professions. Industry offered her employment, at the same time providing her with merchandise and services that undermined her traditional tasks. Today, 
most women work, not in protest against masculine domination, but out of economic necessity. New inventions in communication and ways of travel had an important impact on the traditional family pattern. In 1880, families had rarely traveled long distances, but with the spread of rail facilities, they began to travel more. The arrival of the automobile early in the century made it possible for families to move about even more easily, and history itself accelerated the trend. The stock market crash in 1929 ushered in the greatest economic depression in the nation's history. Whole families were uprooted, forced into movement in the search for work and a way of living. weakened the stability of the family even further. Family groups were temporarily broken by the necessities of war. Many women went to work in factories to support the war effort, and often to supplement the family income. At the end of the war, families were reunited, but the social stability of the American family had been shaken by the increased freedom of women, depression, war, and population movements. Today, we have the smallest family unit in history and the least stable. Our divorce rate has greatly increased. Does this mean that the family as an institution is on the wane? In search of an answer, let us take a closer look at family life today, both on the farm and in the city. Despite wars and depressions, a Harrington family still owns this farm. But many changes have taken place. For example, plowing is done by machine. Although the farmhouse has not changed much on the outside, inside it's a different place. The Mrs. Harrington of today no longer has to spend all her time in the kitchen. Modern conveniences have given her more leisure. Even the Grandma Harrington of today does not have to work as she once did. Although there are still things for today's Grandpa Harrington to do, he is not nearly so important to the farm economy as he once was. There are children in this generation of Harringtons, too, but they have their noonday meal at school. Today, children are less economically important on the farm, and so there's more time for education. Grace is seldom said before meals except on Sunday, but the Harringtons are still church members and attend services. Sunday afternoon on the farm today is very different from the past. It has become a time of recreation rather than religious observance. While John Harrington watches television, his wife goes to a social get-together of the ladies' club. Even recreation is no longer a family affair. The family doesn't enjoy things together as a unit, but separately as individuals. While Grandpa reads his farm journal, Grandma upstairs in the bedroom listens to the radio and reads a woman's magazine. The children have permission to borrow the family car and are going to visit friends in a nearby town. What about a grandfather who lives in an urban setting? Joseph Wingfield is a widower. He's retired. 
and he lives alone in his own house. He's reasonably happy. But today's world is a young world in which 60 is old. And Mr. Wingfield has a feeling of uselessness. His job is over. His children are grown. Anna, his daughter, is married and lives in her own home in the same town. The Norton family is typical of the modern urban family in America, babysitter and all. The small size of the average American family has given women more time for work and for leisure. This has resulted in wider individual expression and activity outside the home. Have you been a good girl today? Yes, Daddy. I'll bet you have. I'll just bet you have. You know, Tom, if you would take the children into the other room, I could get dinner in half the time. Okay, come on, kids. We'll leave your mother alone. You know, tonight is her art class. And it's getting pretty late. You'd better go on ahead. I'll clean this up for you. Well, that's nice of you, Tom, but I can get them started at least, if you can put the kids to bed. Okay. But don't ever let it be said that old Tom Morton never held up art. Onward and upward. Now, don't tease. You know a woman has to have some self-expression. Come on, Janie. Off to bed. Your mother's going to express herself tonight, and I'm going to be your babysitter. Oh, Daddy, you don't look like our babysitter. Maybe not, but I'm going to be your babysitter tonight. Let's go. Be a good girl and go right to bed. Mommy will be in to kiss you good night. In the modern family, the division of labor is much less marked than it once was. Mr. Norton assumes some of the responsibilities once regarded as exclusively feminine. And in the Miller family next door, even the economic responsibility is divided, since Mrs. Miller has a regular job just like her husband. The women leave to attend their art class, while the men stay home and have a bridge game. One of the guests, Fred Small, is going to be married. Henry Enfield, a confirmed bachelor, good-naturedly calls Fred a fool for giving up his freedom for married life. But later that night, when Henry gets home to his lonely apartment, he wonders. The life of freedom was fine when Henry was 20 or even 30, but he's 45 now and he feels pretty alone. A sense of frustration in middle age is a common experience for all people, and companionship is especially needed then. The loneliness and insecurity of cities and the depersonalized life that urban people like Henry Enfield lead have made the intimacy of marriage more desirable. From childhood on, human beings seek emotional security in established habit patterns, and the family habit is an essential one. The family as an institution has changed greatly. It may change even more, and its future is by no means determined. But it still carries out its essential functions, reproduction and the care and socialization of the young. As long as it maintains these functions, it will continue to flourish. <laughs>